Okay, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this evening with the Holberg Laureates of 2019. Um, I'm going to give a short introduction of our two laureates, and then we're going to try to have an open conversation. Um, and there'll be a short Q&A, about 15 minutes uh, towards the end, where we'll welcome questions from the audience. So this year's uh, Nils Klim Prize winner is philosopher Finner Delsen. Delsen is currently an associate professor in philosophy at the University of Iceland and also holds a part-time associate professorship at the Inland University of Applied Sciences here in Norway. He received his PhD from UNC Chapel Hill in 2014 and he's worked as a postdoctoral fellow at University College Dublin. He's also the 2018 recipient of the Launer Prize for Up and Coming Philosophers. And together with Insa Lawler, he has recently been awarded a grant from the Icelandic Research Fund for a three year project called Understanding Progress in Science and Beyond. Um, Del Sen has published a number of papers in recent uh, years in philosophy of science in particular, where he discusses, among other things, the nature of scientific progress, inference to best explanation, and the dynamics of disagreement among scientific experts. The uh, Holberg Prize laureate of 2019 is Paul Gilroy. Uh, Paul is currently a professor of American and English literature at King's College uh, London. But I think it's fair to say that he's not only a professor of American and English literature. He's a fellow of the British Academy, the uh, Royal Society of Literature, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is the author of a number of highly influential books. I mentioned just a few, a few, Darker Than Blue on the Moral uh, Economies of Black Atlantic Cultures, After Empire, The Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness, and there ain't no black in the Union Jack. I should also mention that um, I've noticed that from August 2019, Paul will take up the position uh, of Professor of the Humanities at UCL, also in London, where he will be the founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Racism. So I hope you'll uh, join me in giving them both a warm applause. Okay, um, Finno, I, I'd like to um, start with you a little bit. Um, so this is a chance for you to talk a little bit about your work. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had the Nils Klim seminar that was entitled Why Trust Scientists? And you gave uh, one of the talks, although via video link, and there were other excellent contributors. Um, but now you're here. And um, you know we can talk a little bit um, more about this. So um, I know that one of the main topics of your work uh, is scientific progress. And you have offered, for example, your own analysis uh, of scientific progress in terms of a distinction between knowledge and understanding. Um, but then I also found out, reading a recent interview with you, that in high school, you, I'm going back a bit now, <laughs> you qualified to participate in the International Physics Olympiad. True? Uh, yes. True. <laughs> okay, just checking the facts. Okay. Just checking the facts. So, clearly, you know, you had something going there in physics for a while, and now that you've become <laughs> a philosopher instead, don't you worry that you might have held back Scientific progress. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <clears throat> um, well, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I don't think I was sufficiently interested, actually, in uh, in doing uh, the uh, often very uh, sort of rote work that you need to do as a physicist in order to succeed. So. Uh, at least if you're an experimental physicist or have any connection to experimental physics, then uh, 
You have to do a lot of work that I, I, I guess I kind of slowly discovered that I wasn't uh, really that interested in doing. So, uh, um, But also my, my route to philosophy was also just uh, by pure chance almost. I, uh, uh, I had done so much physics that I, was, uh, I, was, I decided I would take a year off and some of my... Uh, some of my friends were doing uh, trips around the world or doing something actually exciting. I decided to study philosophy for a year instead. Um, and then I, I, I couldn't really go back after that, I guess. So, so, so your gap year was philosophy? Yes, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, this I is how much of a nerd I am. Uh, yeah. so, so can I ask then, I, I, this is, I know this is a question that philosophers get asked all the time. So, so what, you know, why did you get started with philosophy? Well, uh, yeah, I was going to do that gap year in something, and it was either philosophy or history. Um, I'd always been a, like, very interested in history. Uh, but then it was maybe mostly chance or uh, uh, maybe some sort of uh, ambition of a young man who wanted to understand everything. And, um, and then I, so I, I signed up for, uh, for some philosophy courses, and I had some really inspiring teachers where I'm uh, at the University of Iceland, where I'm now uh, uh, an associate professor. And, um, and so I, uh, I sort of got the philosophy bug, you might, might say. Um, philosophy bug, I like that. Yeah. So, so uh, w did it happen in the way where you were already interested in science and then you went straight into the philosophy of science? Or did you go via the sort of long narrative from Plato and Aristotle and then all the way back up to the, you know, the research from philosophy of science today? No, I, I really took the first route that you uh, described where I, I, uh, I started thinking about Questions about how how science works, and uh, and also questions about the foundations of mathematics, which really interested me at the time. Um, and so I, I actually remember doing physics. I didn't really know what philosophy was, but I remember it annoyed me very much when I was just told that these are the laws of nature, and now you're supposed to kind of solve these problems. And I was always kind of questioning, oh, so how do we know that those those are the laws of nature as opposed to these other things? And uh, uh, and then philosophy uh, kind of made me uh, capable of questioning those assumptions, maybe in the in a more systematic way than I was had been had been able to do before. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but the same 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 is true of uh, of mathematics. I was also very interested in mathematics, and uh, and then uh, I, I I took of, co of course a course in logic, as every philosophy student does, and. That was very much uh, kind of a liberation to me. I mean, I, suddenly I could use something that seemed like seemed to have the rigor of mathematics to study argumentation. Uh, and uh, you know, for me, I mean, uh, <laughs> um, many uh, young philosophy students have this kind of thrilling. Uh, uh, it's very, it's very thrilling for them to sort of see the opportunity there to maybe kind of argue with people in a more kind of rigorous way. Of course, then you kind of slowly but steadily realize that that's not so easy. You can't just uh, uh, throw some logic at people and they'll sort of be convinced of the truth. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's it's a great disappointment. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Uh, Ulle is familiar with this, of course, as a, as a professor of logic and other things. So, uh, But yeah, so starting out, that was my hope. And now I, I'm still, I still throw logic at people sometimes. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> it's not going very well, actually. Yeah, we'll we'll return to that. Yeah. Um, so I so I'm wondering then. Uh, so so you had a little bit of background in 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 physics and the sciences before you started with uh, with philosophy. And my impression is that that's getting more and more common now among philosophers of science. So it's not that easy anymore to do philosophy of science without really having some working knowledge of the sciences. Would you say that's? that's yeah, that, that's definitely true. And uh, in fact. I'm, I'm something of a generalist. I'm, I'm, I mean, people, my colleagues in philosophy of science are, many of them are much more familiar with uh, a particular science or a particular debate in science than I am. Uh, I'm more of a generalist at heart, and uh, I, th I think we need those too. Uh, we need people who can approach uh, science and inquiry kind of in a somewhat general way, maybe with particular case studies from, from particular sciences, but also are willing to kind of look at the 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 forest as opposed to just single trees, I suppose. Um, but yes, the, I think philosophy of science is very much changing in the direction of, of uh, you know, m many philosophers of science will have at least an MA degree in a particular science. Yeah. Right. So that's quite yeah. common. And th you think that is a, a benefit to the... I, th to I, th I think we need both. Uh, so I, I guess that's my, my opinion. Mm. We need... Uh, 
we need uh, to have those who specialize in a particular science and, and think about the philosophical questions in those sciences, and we also need the generalists. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid that uh, the pendulum has swung too far now in philosophy of science, that we, we have too few generalists and too many specialists being educated. Uh, hmm. Yeah, that's so, yeah. interesting. I, I, I mean, this, this slogan from, from the philosopher uh, Bernard von Quine comes to mind. Philosophy of science is philosophy of nuff, right? So okay. back then the idea was that all you really needed was philosophy of science, and then right. you didn't need any more philosophy than that. <laughs> uh, but now, it, you know, your work seems to indicate that there is this other direction actually. That just to do philosophy of science, which is just a small philosophy project, you really need to draw on a lot of other types of philosophy. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I think. Uh I mean, in, in my work, I've tried to combine epistemology, which is a theory of knowledge with or the philosophy of knowledge with uh, uh, philosophy of science. And that has sort of been my way of approaching many issues. Um, other people combine philosophy of science with metaphysics, which is sort of the study of what exists and how things exist. Um, and I think that's another way to do uh, philosophy of science, to combine it with a particular other field of philosophy. And I think that's been really fruitful as well. Uh, mm, yeah. Um, I mentioned in the introduction that you have a new research project, um, and it's called Understanding Progress in Science and uh, Beyond, together with a, a colleague, Insa Lawler. And this is something that you've been awarded quite recently, am I right about that? Uh, yes, in, in January, yeah. And when does it start? Well, it's, it started already. Oh, it's started it's a, already. It's sort of we're, uh, we're hiring a postdoc this uh, summer. Uh, yes. Exactly. I read on your website that you're hiring. So I thought <laughs> this was a chance for you to advertise a little bit. <laughs> well, Maybe they're promising people in the room yeah. here um, <laughs> right. so you could sell it in. Um, uh, but I, actually, my question is about the title. So understanding progress, you say, in science and beyond. <laughs> and I'm wondering about the beyond part right. of this. What is the beyond? Well, well, we'll we'll start with philosophy. So we'll start with uh, understanding progress in philosophy itself. So there's been this uh, debate, I suppose, that's been coming up now that uh, philosophers are, are worried, as as many other people are, I suppose, that they aren't actually making any progress. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and and. That, and that, that, I mean, what's missing from that debate, I think, is, is a, an understanding of what, what philosophical progress would be if we had it. Um, and so we want to, part of the project is about understanding what it would be, uh, such that we can know whether, we, we, whether we've got it or at least are getting closer to it. Mm. Right. So, yeah. yeah, well, that sounds very tricky. That sounds tricky. <laughs> do you think there is, there, do you think there has been progress in the philosophy of science over the last couple of decades? I think so, yes, but I think it's, I mean, it, it tends to be kind of modest, and I think it's often, uh, often it's progress where we know what the answer to a question will not look like. Um, so it, it won't be this sort of answer, and it won't be that sort of answer, and so we're sort of eliminating options. But I think that also happens in science, so it's not so, it's not so different. It's not so, uh, it doesn't mean that there's philosophical progress and scientific progress, and they're, they're totally, uh, uh, different from one another. Um, um, I mean, w and also I think it's worth noting that, I mean, one reason may maybe why we're not making so much progress in philosophy as we would like is that the questions are just very general kinds of questions. Um, and so it's not so surprising that we can't find a good generalization about, say, what knowledge is or how to act, for example, <laughs> as ethicists, normative ethicists would like. Um, that's completely general and true of, in all cases. Uh, that's such an enormous uh, theory to have. That would be like uh, having a theory of all, uh, f all motion or something like that. So it's not so surprising that you know, philosophy, which is a relatively small field in the grand scheme of things, hasn't made that much progress on, on certain things. So. so I'm an optimist, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Paul, are you an optimist? <laughs> no, I'm a cosmic pessimist. <laughs> no, I'm a cosmic pessimist, I suppose. Um, and the resources of hope that people uh, who are as fortunate as I am uh, are obliged to articulate sit in a disjunctive relationship with that cosmic pessimism. I'm a disciple of Giacomo Leopardi, so I I don't really um, I don't indulge in in in, in, in uh, I, I try to be hopeful against hope. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> what about progress in your own work? Maybe that's a little bit more down to earth. Do you feel there's been progress in your own work? In, in my, no, I think I, I, I'm ashamed to say that when I'm tidying the house or throwing things away and I find the essays I wrote when I first <laughs> went to university, which well, it's a bit like you in your physics, you know, mm -hmm. um, when I find those things, I'm always shocked at how early we are formed and how our obsessions, much as we would like them to progress and develop, or maybe I just don't know my own work, but that's also a possibility. Um, that how early we, how early it is that we are formed in our in the obsessions and habits and ways of thinking and the problems that that, that bother us mm -hmm. and I feel I've, I've brought these problems with me from my teenage years I mean I don't know if I'm getting better at answering them or not um, and and of course there's always a, a kind of temporal discrepancy between saying something in a in a climate in which it can be heard and understood yeah. And uh, there's a la there are often lags there and discrepancies there that one, one can't control. And the temptation is to, is to repeat oneself. <laughs> um, so there are the repetitions you, you choose and the repetitions that you uh, generate without that choice being engaged. So I'm, I'm a sort of creature of, of repetitions, really. And um, sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was interesting that you, you called it obsessions. I think. Yes, uh, yes. So do you have any idea where those obsessions, uh, how they were formed? So, you know, Finnett told us a little bit about how his obsessions were formed. Yeah, I, I wonder. I mean, my father was a chemist and in, uh, and uh, does strong scientific training. So it's partly, I think, my reaction against his habits of mind. He was also a mathematician. So, uh, and my mother was a poet and a writer. So, um, I, in a way, I guess I've cleaved to the maternal line in this respect, <laughs> uh. and that something of my rebounding from science, um, as a, I mean, I, I think I, uh, when physics, physics, the school, I, secondary school I went to, uh, we used to do, you know, quadruple physics on a Wednesday or something, <laughs> and that was often the day I chose not to go to school, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, although I remember my experiments with a copper calorimeter or whatever, it, uh, antediluvian technology was the was the play was the the, the, the substance of that kind of uh, mm. educational play. Mm. Um, I wasn't engaged with physics uh, as a. Uh, ma materialist uh, uh, exercise, I suppose, and until I became much more interested in, in particle physics and the more philosophical end of those conversations and Bell's theorem and all that kind of stuff, that engaged me in a, perhaps in a more poetic way than in a... And this a happened then and quite happened a bit later. later. Yes, well, it, I think the two things, uh, my rejection of the calorimeter combined with my interest in particle physics and things of that sort, mm. but I never imagined that that was a w world I would enter in a way my intellectual life has been defined by things that I, I didn't really want to engage in. You know, I didn't think that at the age of 63 I'd be sitting in, in a room um, talking about racism. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. wasn't my choice. Yeah. I was interested in lots of other interesting things and I wanted to, I wanted to pursue those things in a high level when I went to be a research student. I got a scholarship to do that. But when I got into the university, uh, which was an unusual department really of cultural studies, I realized that I'd had to abandon the project for which I was funded and to try to find other things that seemed more politically imperative to me. Right, exactly. And um, nobody who was disciplining me at that point of my training was held to account by the government. So I was a sort of happy product of the, of the luxury of, of being uh, financed to pursue your curiosity, and I managed to twist it into a pattern that satisfied me politically. But it wasn't one, I mean, now it's, it's almost embarrassing to still be talking about these things, frankly. <laughs> They're not the things I want to be talking about. Yeah. There are other many more important things for, for that I see in the world that I w would rather be, be speaking about. about and learning about. Right. Yeah. So that's a, a different kind of thing. That th there are the obsessions that you form yeah. when you're young, yes. and then there is the kind of stuff that you gravitate towards later yes. on because of the external. Yes, because factors. you have to you abandon your obsessions and develop another motivation. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's interesting that uh, in, in some sense that's a, a kind of a, a calling to answer some sort of um, question that is, you know, that's out there and then using the theoretical resources you have and then trying to, to get at it, right? It's something that's out there that everyone can, can see. And, 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 I, and I get the impression from you, Finno, too, that in your more recent work, maybe something a little bit similar hap has happened to you. So you worked on a lot of theoretical mm -hmm. philosophy. 
But then it, it seems to me now, you know, reading your recent papers and then listening to the, to the seminar yesterday, that you're starting to identify a problem in so society, something that you know, lots of people are deeply concerned with. And then you're trying to look in your own toolbox and figure out, can I assist here in some, mm -hmm. in some way, right? And then your question now is, why should we trust scientists, right? And there, there seems to be this uh, deficiency of, of, uh, of trust and the, the uh, public needs some sort of help maybe to, to figure out how do we know who to, who to trust. Uh, yeah, that, that's exactly right. So, um, I mean, in many ways, I think I envy Paul for, and, and also admire Paul for, for kind of starting out talking about things that are uh, so close to his heart and uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so things that, that he cares so deeply about. And in, in some ways, uh, in my academic work, I mean, it's been a sort of a retreat from things that I, uh, I uh, think are sort of more political and, and ethical issues that I care more about. Uh, where you can uh, uh, do these neat, solve these neat problems in a neat <laughs> kind of uh, system, mm. but uh, but now that I don't have to care so much about uh, sort of the more practical side of things in in my mm. career, yeah. I do want to move to more uh, questions that are more sort of uh, closer to my heart uh, in terms of uh, uh, yeah, eth ethical and political questions. And uh, so for for a long time, I just kept all the all, all my politics and ethics and that sort of thing separate from my my work in philosophy. But but now I want to kind of bring them together now that I feel more secure in my, uh, uh, ah, in my situation. Right. I think. permanent job. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I mean, one of the most interesting anti-racist voices in our in our country is the philosopher Michael Dummett, whose work I'm sure you're familiar with. And I, last uh, month I was giving the Isaiah Berlin Memorial Lecture in Oxford and I, I wanted to explore certain aspects of the formation of um, Oxford. Uh, I, was, I, mean, I know Berlin's not perhaps in your terms of philosopher as such. There are other elements in what he's doing, but anyway. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, I was drawn to read the uh, book that Michael Dummett had written about racism. He wrote at the end, towards the end of his life under the... Uh, Exhortation of Simon Critchley, who was here earlier but seems to have disappeared. Oh. And it was very curious reading this book to think of, of someone, a mathematical philosopher of that um, distinction, who begins his book by saying that he could not imagine any way in which his philosophical interests and his political interests might have been connected. In fact, he couldn't even think of a way of connecting them until he reached his mid-70s and wrote this particular book, <laughs> which is a very interesting um, uh, process. Well, I don't know, recovery, discovery, one of those, one or the other. So, so this, is, this is fascinating to me, that, that, that how, how difficult that joining, that uh, confluence can be. I mean, whether it's desirable or not, I would set aside because for some it will be and for others it, it, it's fine. I'm not, it's not a policing operation here. I, I just was very struck by, by how important Michael Dummett's um, political and ethical work, which is, I suppose, rooted in his faith uh, rather than in his political um, attachment as such, how remote it seems to have been from his achievements as a, a linguistic and mathematical philosopher. And that, I thought, was an interesting case, actually, mm. that I want to investigate further. That is very interesting. You're hitting quite close to home, actually. Michael Dommett was one of the philosophers I wrote my PhD on. Oh, uh, and I, I always video. thought this was really interesting mm. uh, as well. And it, it made me also think about um, another philosopher that, that uh, both Finno and I mm. were interested in, uh, Bertrand Russell, mm -hmm. who's also someone who worked, you know, there are these sort of, this kind of imagery of mm. him as a young, kind of brilliant mind who was, you know, sitting around working out difficult mathematics puzzle. And then at some point, he, he, he abandoned that. And I think, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but the quote is kind of, well, I have to leave this to the young people now, right? But at that <laughs> point, he's you know, 21 or something like that. <laughs> um, and then, of course, he goes on to then develop this uh, enormous interest for mm -hmm. political life and uses his, uh, his voice in that way. So uh, I don't know, I, I want to ask you this, Fino. Do you share my impression that this is a general development in philosophy, at least in our part of philosophy now, that people with very theoretical interests are moving into debates that are more directly tied to societal problems? Uh, yeah, that's definitely uh, my impression, that this is, I mean, I think Michael Dummett would have written his book on racism uh, a lot sooner, I think, today, uh, 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 basically. Uh, I think the climate is changing very much uh, in uh, 
you know, analytic philosophy of mm. science, the kind mm. of uh, or, uh, philosophy in general. Um, right. So, um, mm. yeah. So I think that's and it. what accounts for that? What accounts for that stimulus? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, uh, I think, in part, just uh, just the, there's more kind of diversity of uh, people with different backgrounds and of different identities and, and that sort of thing. Is uh, that's changing quite quickly in, in philosophy. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking Anglo Anglo American philosophy. Sure. I think that might be part of it, but that's not the whole story. I think there's also just a, a general sense that. Uh, if philosophy is to survive, it needs to be mm. relevant mm. Uh, uh, in some way. So is that progress by your definition? Ah, ah. I like, oh, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm handing Let's over see. to you now. <laughs> That's, oh uh. my. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. We'll just appreciate that bridge a little bit, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, definitely, yeah. I would, I would want to say that's, uh, that's progress, yeah. Mm. Mm. It, it, this is a difficult question as well. I mean, is there some kind of issue of privilege here that certain people have been privileged to be able to work on these sorts of problems that are very detached from the society around them, right? The way that you mm. describe Michael Dummett, it sounds like that, mm. right? He, he's writing about the metaphysics of logic mm. And you know that's a pretty abstract uh, topic, if, if anything it is. And then you know suddenly he, he he looks around and he's oh there's this other thing and I want to say something about it. Um, Although he was an activist, mm. that's the thing I think. I, and what's interesting and this is, relates to what Finner said about how he might have been able to see how to connect his activist life with his philosophical professional practice at an earlier point uh, these days. Uh, the risks perhaps wouldn't have been no no I mean he was in a very secure pos position um, quite early on because of his obvious distinction so so I, so I wonder I do I do wonder about that um, yeah I, I, and, 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 and I don't actually I, I don't even know if it's 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 a good thing because we we know sometimes that the premature coupling of these uh, areas of, of, of life and thought and reflection doesn't necessarily improve either the activism or the philosophical work. Um, but, you know, let 10,000 flowers bloom. Mm -hmm. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. So, actually, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier about, um, you know, the early stages of your own career. Mm. So I read an interview um, that you did with the Times Higher Education. It's very oh. recent. I think it's okay. the beginning of this mm. year. Um, actually, it might even be after the, the, after prize, the prize was, uh, was yes, announced. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the, the, the opening line is great. You say, nothing beats being taken seriously. Mm. Yeah. And I thought that was great. And then I, I thought a little bit about that. And of course, we all, you know, as academics, we strive to be taken seriously, yeah. right? And, and, um, and that's hard when you know when you don't go to university. You go to want to go to university, and you want to impress your peers, and then you do an MA, and you mm. want to do a PhD, and you you know you you want recognition for your work. But then the the next section of that interview, um, you recall how after the publication of one of your early books, "There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack," uh, quote, it was made very clear to me that my temporary contract of employment wasn't going to be continued. And I thought, oh, there's a story here. This sounds <laughs> uh, interesting. And then yeah. the interview doesn't say anything more about it. So I was hoping well, there is a story there. I'm not sure it's a story worth telling. Um, it's only, I suppose, a sense that it, I suppose, perhaps it relates to the time lags or something. That would be a generous reading of it. I, I, I was, like many insecure academics at an early, uh, in the present moment, you know, somebody who wanted to enter academic life and felt their vocation, felt the kind of calling it there, perhaps, um, without sounding too grand about it, and managed to secure one or two temporary contracts. When the book came out, I thought, aha, because I had been involved in writing a book before that. And I thought, well, I've done enough now, you know, yeah. to, get my, to, get, to get in. And uh, where I was working at that time, uh, I, I won't name any names, there's no point. But uh, but this particular person was a kind of ideological 
apparatchik of the Thatcher revolution at that time. And when the manager of my faculty, the dean, went with my work to uh, ask this person if it might be possible to imagine a way in which I might make the transition from a precarious employee to a, I mean, tenure had gone, I think, or was just going at that time. We don't have tenure in our universities. Uh, um, he was uh, abruptly told that that wasn't, that after flicking through the book, it was cl made clear, or perhaps looking at the cover, I don't <laughs> know, that that wasn't going to be my fate, you know. And, and a lot of this, you, we know a lot of this goes on. I mean, there, there are some uh, wonderful websites these days where we can look at the uh, comments which are uploaded on um, scholarly papers by reviewers who are school settling scores or incapable of grasping the arguments in front of them and so on. And I think there is a sense that that transparency is also perhaps part of the progress that you identified, that, that people are these days held to account in a much more um, uh, robust way for, for some, of those, um, some of those bad habits which sneak into university administration occasionally. Right. Has it happened that you have encouraged, say, a PhD student to pursue something that you thought was maybe career-wise difficult, but that you thought was this is too interesting, intellectually rewarding, not to to pursue? Well, once or twice I've been caught out, yes, by that um, encouragement, um, which you know there is a certain foolhardiness. Uh, there is a, a certain foolhardiness about. I remember one thesis I was involved. In, I won't again. I won't name name the person, but I was thinking about it this morning when uh, Professor McKittrick was talking about wire in our um, symposium, and this was a, a, a PhD which was a kind of cultural history of um, duct tape. <coughs> duct tape, you know, yeah. one of these uh, military innovations which sneaks into everyday life and is yeah. a rather useful thing. And I, I feel, I've always felt slightly guilty about encouraging that particular thesis uh, to be completed, although personally I judged it to be a, a work of extreme, uh, cr cr extremely um, high value and creativity and connected together all sorts of quite interesting philosophical themes about the social uh, life of objects and uh, the um, you know, encroachment of military technologies and military innovations and progress in the area of killing and fighting you know into the into the cracks of everyday into the cracks of everyday life so i have had that experience a few times but i i try not to exhort my students to do anything really right. i'm, right. I'm right. most of the time running along behind them trying to catch up with what <laughs> they want to do that sounds like a good feeling so but uh, Fino, you you suggested in the way that you you formulated yourself earlier that you you might have thought twice about starting this new project if you had still been in, uh, on a temporary contract. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not so much that I, I fear p political re repercussions or uh, something along those lines. It's not that sort of project, I don't think. I mean, uh, uh, fairly innocent. But, it, but it's also a matter of, I mean, when you, when you st st this kind of project about sort of white trust science, is, it, it requires, I think, uh, a lot of background work going into uh, the sociology of science mm -hmm. and various literatures that I'm not all that familiar with, you know, and you, you have a certain background, you have a certain education, so it's, it's easier to just kind of continue on that path mm -hmm. where you, you know the literature that you need to know in order to <laughs> get the next publication or the next result or whatever it is, whereas uh, going into a different field where the maybe it's very interdisciplinary or it's just very hard, you're starting something new, that, that's riskier. Um, and so. That's really mostly what I was referring to, mm, right. um, and and but but also I mean when when things are when there's sort of political things at stake, uh, I do think it's a you might you might might need to uh, be more careful in in how you work, and so uh, when the pressure is off, when you have a permanent position, you can it's easier to do those sorts of things. You don't need to worry so much about uh, the next you, result. Yeah, would, would you agree that it? it does look a little bit intimidating these days to pick certain philosophical topics, um, the kind of topics that tend to give a lot of backlash on social media, and not necessarily from the general mm. audience, but also from other philosophers. Um, you know, feminism is one, but identity politics more more general. Mm. I mean, even people engaging in just highly theoretical discussions about that, they get um, uh, swarmed with 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 um, hate, hateful messages on, on social media. 
Yeah, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I think that certainly discourages people from doing the sort of work they ought to be doing, uh, hopefully. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, but there's also a danger that people will kind of, you know, nonchalantly kind of wander into an area like, uh, like the philosophy of race, for example, would be a good place where yes. you don't want people to wander into them with no knowledge and just kind of make all these pronouncements. You know, you want some people who actually know the literature or have relevant experiences themselves to, to, uh, to be the ones who are writing uh, about these things. So, I mean, there's... Right, so, so I mean, it's important to kind of also have respect for the, the material when it's an important political material, I think. I, I was yeah. wondering when you were speaking earlier on, um, particularly about this question of trusting scientists, I mean, the elephant here with us walking there at the back is really a question of, of climate catastrophe, yeah. and that, I assume, is the unspoken content. I, I'm very sorry that I wasn't able to attend the seminar because I was otherwise occupied, yeah. but, I mean, my, my hunch would be that that must be some sort of um, feature in in the framing of that of, the, of, of that project, and that that interests me very much. You know, from a, a sort of I guess epistemological um, a, epistemological angle, partly because in my own work I've been rather influenced by some of the historians uh, uh, of science, particularly uh, Lunda Schiebinger. I don't know if you've come across her. She's um, a feminist uh, historian of science and sometime commentator on aspects of gender and science and, and so on. But she's, she's somebody who's known really as a, a, as a colonial historian and as a historian of racial science in particular. And she and her um, uh, uh, partner, Robert Proctor, who you may also, who's worked on cancer, you may know, on the tobacco lobby, um, are people who've really uh, pressed very hard to shift the emphasis away from sociologies of knowledge um, and much more towards sociologies of ignorance. Mm -hmm. And they coined that one, they've been part of a conversation uh, over recent years that's developed this concept of agnotology, of not knowing things. And I think this work came really, or this, this way of thinking, this stimulus to thought, came really out of the work that Proctor was doing as an expert witness in the um, court cases around the tobacco lo lobby. And the argument that the tobacco lobbyists and the scientists that they cultivated um, rather gleefully let's say, um, took a position in which they, could, they knew that they could produce uncertainty. And that if they could produce uncertainty, a sort of microclimate of uncertainty, this could be juridically strategic, this could be politically and economically productive to them. So I was, I was really thinking about climate change within that uh, perspective and wondering if these were some of the sorts of questions that were stimulating you. Yes, that, that, that sort of question is very much uh, the sort of question was that was stimulating me. Um, I want to just mention that, that uh, the work by Sheep, Sheepinger and Proctor is something that I, I just learned about a few days ago. Huh. And so this is an example of the sort of work where you, if, and when you step into a, a field like this, you need yes. to know so much more, I think, yes. than uh, when you're just writing on, uh, well, I don't know, inference to the best explanation right. or something very technical in uh, philosophy of science. <laughs> um, but but so, so to answer your question, I mean, uh, I, have, I do have a, a sort of a, a paper planned on, on, on something close to this question where um, I want to challenge, I mean, I think there's assumption, an assumption underlying uh, the strategy to kind of produce doubt or mm -hmm. also through disagreement, I think, often, mm -hmm. oftentimes. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you try to produce doubt by, by drawing drawing uh, out people who uh, at least claim to disagree with the consens consensus position, say yes. about climate change or something yes. like that. And, uh, and uh, one thing that I, uh, I want to do is, 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 is think more about sort of where uh, consensus is needed and where, where it's uh, actually um, um, uh, desirable in order to, uh, uh, to make a, an inference about sort of the truth of the things that we have a consensus on. So I think actually there's, there's uh, some uh, s somewhat technical but also somewhat intuitive reason to think that you, when there's a complete consensus about something, that's, that's not sort of the best epistemic situation to be in, but mm -hmm. rather uh, so the, the, the situation in which you should have the most trust in some theory that, that's being claimed to be true is where you have a, a, a large majority but not a complete consensus. And so actually I think like the fact that you can draw out some uh, single scientists that claim to disagree with the majority position actually should not at all reduce your confidence that mm -hmm. 
the theory uh, that the majority claims to be true is true. Uh, and I think there are kind of <laughs> uh, interesting, uh, uh, I think it's actually kind of a, a subtle fallacy to make that sort of claim. Uh, mm. And so then maybe we can get the word out in some, mm. <laughs> uh, and, and uh, uh, correct this misunderstanding. I think. That, that's very interesting. And I, and I kind of agree with it in situations where I'm in the majority. Uh -huh. <laughs> but if I'm actually, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but but I'm not so comfortable with it when it's flipped around the other yeah. way. And uh, I was thinking then when you sketched that, uh, really about racial science uh -huh. and about the minority within the field who persistently and tenaciously and aggressively hold on to the idea against everything we've ever learned about human uh, human variation um, to a set of concepts <coughs> derived from um, you know the re the terminal points of European trading activity circa, I don't know, 1780 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, so, so to, to see it that way around is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a different, f for me, is an al alarming. Because you might end up being rather more tolerant and respectful of things that you might more, which you have no interest in, in entertaining as ration reasonable, as reasonable, okay. toolmen reasonable. Well, actually, I, I would want to claim that in that sort of case where you have a, a small minority of mm. uh, racial essentialists mm. or, yeah, uh, or whatever, uh, something yeah, like that, um, uh, you have even more reason to believe the majority than if there were, was mm. a complete consensus. Uh, mm. So, like a complete consensus is like a you know, like, a, like a Russian election mm. where you have like 100 percent uh, <laughs> uh, votes for this one yes. candidate. I mean. One thing about Russian, when you hear, I mean, if you just have like a, an unnamed country and you hear that 100% of the uh, of the populace voted for a particular yeah. candidate, you get two kinds of information. First, I mean, just directly about the vote, but also there's something fishy going on in that vote. Um, and, and that's the sort of thing that I think applies in science as well, where if there was a complete consensus about, thing, about something, well, you'd, you'd have some information about something fishy going on in that particular field. Mm. Um, when there's some small ma minority that sort of, you know, is being <laughs> dragged out mm. to disagree with the majority, um, that's exactly the sort of thing you should expect to happen in a mm. an open, with, uh, you know, field where there's an open debate between mm. and people are allowed to express disagreement. Mm. Okay. And so the fact that there's this sort of this small minority of racial essentialists should actually kind of be a weapon against the racial essentialists in a, in a, in a sort well, of... Well, because, because they're a minority. Yeah. B because they're such a small minority... Right, right. Uh, and and there's there's they're they're not non-existent. If they were non-existent, I think that would be, uh, mm. I mean, not necessarily a, a big worry, but a, mm. a slight worry that mm. about the whole field. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, from from outside, seen from outside. Yeah. I mean, I you know when I worked, at, I won't say which institution I wor worked in before. One of my colleagues was um, um, an evolutionary biologist who persistently argued that sub-Saharan Africans Africans were intellectually inferior. And that if you were symmetrical in your body, you were much more likely to be in intelligent and, uh, and to be recognized as beautiful by other people. And this was a tenured person who um, I, I never really understood how he could teach a classroom of international students holding these beliefs. But the university administrators didn't want to make an issue of it, as far as I know, goodness knows what was going on behind closed doors. So, so I'm sort of wondering. I'm wondering about that kind of thing. Well, I, I don't even. I don't know how or where it might qualify as science within mm. our mm. conversation. There's a, obviously a di dispute about the boundary there, but but I mean there are there are quite a lot of cases of that kind that one can, can find, and and often where those disagreements appear, the um, how can I put it? The epistemological problems uh, recede. Um, there's an easy epistemological victory. But the sort of effective victory mm -hmm. is um, is uh, is the dominant element, mm -hmm. and and I really wonder about how we look at, at the world in seeing that adjustment being so frequently evident. Yeah, and that's such an interesting uh, issue and question. I think. Um, I mean, when I'm thinking of disagreement among experts or scientists, you mm -hmm. know, I'm. <laughs> I'm thinking of the sort of disagreement where it's sort of they're talking to each other and they mm. sort of realize mm. that they're... And mm. then there's a, uh, then there's this thing, I mean, they, the, each one of those scientists can go out and speak to the public. Yeah. And often they'll speak not just uh, for themselves, they say, I have this opinion, but 
they will sort of be speaking in the name of science. Exactly. And so that's the, the, and that's especially in the, in the classroom, of course, then as a teacher, that's usually the sort of role that you're playing. Mm. You're saying, this is what we believe in biology, or this mm. is what we believe in, in philosophy, or mm. something like that. And, mm -hmm. and so that's, I think, the, the main issue with, with this person uh, that you're yeah, familiar with. this nameless that, person, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, that, uh, in which, I mean, beyond just reprehensible beliefs and that sort of thing, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. there's sort of this, really misconduct, I think. Mm. And so uh, so I guess for that reason, uh, I, I'm somewhat in the camp of, of those who'd say it's not always, I mean, it's not, I mean, we're not infringing on that person's freedom of oh, speech no. by mm. uh, restricting what they can say in the classroom. I think no. you know, they're, in, they're there in a role as an educator and they're supposed to speak on the behalf of a mm. field or a science or, or mm. something like that. And so you shouldn't really be happy with them saying just whatever they like in that role, I think. Mm. Yeah. That's my opinion on this yeah, sure. uh, hot yeah. topic, I suppose. Yeah. So one thing that I, I, I've noticed about your work is that in addition to you know, more traditional philosophical approaches to these issues, you've also co-authored a paper using empirical methods to study disagreement among, among scientists. I think that's kind of interesting. Right, yeah, so that's hopefully coming out every day now, uh, any day, uh, yeah. Um, yes, but so that's, uh, I mean, it's something that's happening in philosophy where philosophers are, are beginning to do some empirical studies as well, so it's a very uh, unusual thing for many, <laughs> for many people, but uh, we're allowed to, we're not, there's nothing to... We're allowed to, to look at the world every yes, now yeah. and then. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, uh, so we did some, uh, some studies on, on how scientists understand uh, disagreement amongst themselves and also how they sort of understand their relationships with theories and how the history of science maybe does undermine or doesn't undermine their attitudes towards theories and, and those sorts of things. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'm kind of interested in this um, the, the sort of um, multitude of, of um, methodologies that you apply, right? So as I said, I mean, you're a traditional philosopher, you engage with traditional uh, epistemological arguments, but you're also interested in formal logic, as you mentioned earlier, right? So formal <laughs> methods in philosophy, probability theory, and also uh, empirical methods. And of course, uh, as well in your case, you also kind of just transcend a number of different fields and, and draw on you know, history and, and Yes, yeah, liter literature and, uh, and social theory and so on and so forth. How important is you know, this ability to draw on this many methodologies in order to create you know, truly original work? Well, I mean, I, I don't know we can answer that generally. Uh, we can only give cases where we, we, we see that. And I suppose some of the, the thinkers and writers and um, um, the voices the voices that have inspired me most of people who have been most inclined to trespass against those boundaries and and that might also mean in the in the larger frame you know um, how can I put it a, a sort of bigger space between the role of the scholar and the role of the intellectual because to be a successful scholar in present conditions a successful academic in present conditions doesn't necessarily uh, qualify you for being a good public intellectual. It may be that being a good intellectual disqualifies you mm. from being a successful good, academic. Good. That's exactly where, where I was headed. Yeah, mm. thank you. So the uh, so so actually in in um, on your website, Finner, I, I noticed that there is a whole uh, page dedicated to outreach. I think that's really nice. <laughs> so uh, on your outreach page, you write a little bit about um, um, Papers you've written, uh, you know, sort of popularizing philosophical ideas uh, for, about philosophy of science and so uh, and so forth. And then there's also this little uh, bit about a program that you were part of uh, when you were a grad student, um, and it was something like an outreach program where you taught philosophical ideas to, together with other graduate students to um, secondary school kids and. Um, um, and people at at um, uh, retirement homes. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah, I think they were elementary school kids. Elementary even. schools. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I have taught in, in secondary school before I, I went to grad school, so I, I think I've taught at every <laughs> uh, all the levels except for uh, kindergarten, I suppose. Um, um, 
uh, right, so I, I think I'm getting too much credit for something that I was only kind of briefly involved with, but it, it was, this is more... Uh, uh, this the, is the your moment to The University the of uh, North Carolina was uh, <laughs> set up this program where uh, uh, the grad students could go into uh, elementary school and teach, uh, teach the kids there, and also into retirement homes, and have these discussions with, uh, yeah, with the, uh, the people living there. And uh, yeah, both were good, great fun, and uh, we had lots of fun, and... Uh, we talked a lot about, I remember one session with, uh, with some old folks talking about whether the history of science undermines uh, <laughs> its claim to truth now, uh, that sort of thing. And it was very lively discussions, two hours. It was, <laughs> it was a lot of fun, yeah. Yeah, I thought it sounded like a great idea when I, when I yeah, read so about it, and why don't we do this, this right. everywhere. And my thinking was that I actually, if you want to become not only an academic philosopher, an academic in mm -hmm. another field, but actually an intellectual that can you know, reach out to the general audience. Maybe that's exactly the kind of training we need. Sometimes I find that mm -hmm. to find the philosophical tools that really work, I'm better off speaking to my dad, say, right? <laughs> trying to convince him of some idea, and then I really get to test whether or not there's something, mm -hmm. something to this. Can it be communicated? Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing I want to say is that we're, I mean, I, I live in Iceland now, and, uh, um, and so the, the philosophy community in Iceland is, is small because we're so, we're, there's so few of us in Iceland. And, um, so one thing that we need to do, therefore, is like when, we, when we have talks and public events of any kind, really, it, it's almost always quite accessible to, to uh, the general public, really. And uh, I think that's a very, very nice thing about Icelandic <laughs> academia, really, not just philosophy is that we, we have to keep things uh, on a relatively understandable level. And, uh, and for me, at least, that that's, that's not, doesn't really, I mean, our, my research or even talks where I want to focus on some issue that I haven't really thought through, I think it doesn't really suffer from that sort of audience because often, like, just putting things in plain language really helps you to understand it better yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I think that's a, that's a sort of an accidentally great feature about uh, philosophy in Iceland, at least. Yeah. <laughs> uh. One of many. Yeah, yeah, One yeah of many. sure. Um, so, but have you thought about this, the fact that now you, you'll be navigating this issue that you'll have uh, students and PhD students and they're starting their academic careers mm -hmm. and you're in a position where you're giving them advice about how to uh, promote those careers, but at the mm -hmm. same time you, you might want to give them this ability um, to reach out with their ideas um, more widely. Would you follow that up in a, in a way that's different from the training that you had yourself? Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess I would, I would emphasize uh, trying to put things in, in plain language. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think we, we probably need to set up something like the retirement home thing in, in Iceland, maybe, or uh, we, could, we could, but also some, many, many of the people who had been in retirement homes actually come to the talk, so, uh, so kind of, <laughs> it's, it's not such an issue. So, uh, no, no, but yeah, definitely, I think, I think that's important, and I think uh, um, it's easy to get lost in like, esoteric debates uh, in your field, but I think it's important to step outside of that and, uh, and uh, to think about other things. In my circumstances, of course, all of these calculations and discussions have been severely distorted by the financial penalty now attached to the idea of becoming more highly educated. Yeah. And uh, over the you know, recent years, since the fees were raised to levels which are um, you know, a disincentive, frankly, mm -hmm. to pursue your, curio your curiosity, had some conversations with people trying to maintain uh, interventions, uh, free education outside of the walls of the university and so on. And uh, the problem that they have shared with me in their own aspiration to maintain these things is that it's all very well to set up your own free university and to draw on the expertise of retired colleagues and others who have, well, if not knowledge, if not wisdom, at least knowledge to impart, um, is that the, most of the people who want to come into that space and learn are people who are already very highly educated. And yeah. so there is that uh, inevitable this difficulty. This has been a very drastic development. In, in yes, and, and a, an appalling development, and one I feel strongly about because, of course, I belong to that generation that was paid to go to university, right. mm. but yeah. did not, uh, wasn't uh, financially penalised to go. Uh, we were paid to go.
I seem to remember that uh, when I was in the UK, they, the prices, or the ceiling anyway, for the annual fee at the yes. universities went up from something like £3,000 yes. to £9,000 nine, yes, yes. just overnight. Yes. And that's a dramatic change, yes. so certainly from a perspective, a, a Norwegian perspective and an Icelandic perspective where the university... Oh, it's a, I mean, what I'm not going to... I'm, it's nothing but a source of shame to me. And the, you know, the report... Uh, the report uh, that warranted this development was, you know, produced by someone who was known publicly to be prepared to spend fifteen hundred pounds on a bottle of uh, of good red wine. So, uh, that, in my view, um, disqualifies him from being able to make, uh, you know, reasonable judgments about such matters. But right. I'm, you know, I'm a deviant. So, what can <laughs> we say? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you keep on anticipating my question. Ah, okay. <laughs> good. Good. It is good, I guess. Mm. Um, now, Bergen is a um, is a small city, um, so there's not a lot of things going on in any given um, any given evening. But this evening, there's a, the conversation here in um, in Literaturhuset, and there's also a concert. Uh, it's an Elton John concert, actually. I was made aware of this uh, over dinner <laughs> last night. Um, and I thought, well, it's an Elton John concert. I should try to make some kind of connection between <laughs> Elton John and, and your work. And then I realized that you had be be beaten me to it. Reg. Reg? We can call him Elton. We Reg. call him Reg. Reg. Mm. Reg. Reg. Yeah. Reg. You'd beaten me to it by 22 years. Oh. You've, you've actually written... A, 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 a paper um, that is called uh, Elton Screening England's Dreaming. Funnily enough, I did. Yeah. I completely forgotten that. Yeah, you <laughs> see, so now we're returning to those papers that, that's been lying around. Yeah. Okay. You've you written so much, you've forgot, that's you've forgotten interesting. Uh, I'm it's sorry impressive. about that. Yes, you, you've got me there. <laughs> and do you remember the context of this as well now? It oh, was I'm the death of Diana. Yes, it was the right. death of Diana, yeah. and I was I was really trying to oppose some of the more sort of mawkish things that people on the left, feminist writers who really ought to have known better, were saying about the emotionalization of politics on that occasion. If I remember correctly, and I don't remember the details, I've got the details. I, yeah. Oh yeah, I no. bet you do. <laughs> no, I, I was really I was really trying to oppose that. I mean, Elton, I, I don't you know, it's not not my thing, you know, and good luck to him and all that. <laughs> But, um, well, you do tell us what is your thing. Do I? In, in the, that paper? Yeah, in the oh, paper. Dear. I mean, it's not a music <laughs> review, but it does. I mean, you actually do mention the Sex Pistols. Oh, do I? I'm just uh, yes, refreshing well, your memory now. Well, I mean, is there a future in England's dreaming? <laughs> I don't. I, I, I think the jury's out, actually. Um, I think the jury's out there. So, there, I mean, it's, it's called Elton's Crooning England's Dreaming, and you, you, you talk about... Um, <coughs> Johnny Rotten's uh, assault mm -hmm. on the, uh, I think you call it the interminable dreaming of England. Mm -hmm. And now, um, uh, you also say, by the way, that you know, this, this, this whole, these days after uh, Diana's funeral, they, they uh, didn't you know, move us forward toward the 21st century, but rather back mm -hmm. to the 18th century. And so I'm wondering now, uh, you know, this 22 years on, after Brexit, and now we're genuinely in the 21st century. Is, is England still dreaming that same dream? Well, I mean, I actually, I, I find it very hard to play the answer for laughs, actually, because it terrifies me. Um, building a bridge to the 18th century. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it depends on what you think England is actually to be philosophical in my response yeah. to a philosopher. Because this is an English problem. It's not a problem the Scots have. It's certainly not a problem the Irish have. Um, and Johnny Rotten's, you know, um, snarl uh, to that effect is something that echoes in my, in my ears, really. Um, although, of course, he's another expatriate uh, who um, who plays some rather dubious and um, what's the word disingenuous roles in contemporary politics and has rather left his his um, ins insurgency behind mm, yeah. 
Um, so yes, I think the the, 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 the the brief answer is yes. I think the durability of those of those fantasies of recovering greatness of um, I mean at least at least in the context of the death of Diana now if I were writing this again now I would say that at least the nation was summoned in some sort of recognizably pluralistic guise that when people went to mourn Diana my memory was and I can't remember if I put this in this paper that when they went and stood by the flowers they not only wept together but I, I remember seeing people with notepads and pencils and they were many people writing furiously this of course being the era before mobile phones became the yeah, uh, yeah. the rosary uh, ah. that people carried with them um, yeah, yeah. So, so things have changed a lot since then but yes the patterns the iterations are essentially the same so this was this was written some years before your book, uh, Postcolonial yes. Melancholia, yes. I believe. Yes, it was but a germ of some of that thing. Exactly, that's what I was thinking. Mm. So that is the slumber that mm. you're yes, describing indeed. in this paper. Yes. And now, uh, just these days, we have um, Donald Trump visiting um, the UK mm. um, and um, meeting with the the um, the Queen. And uh, um, that's in that's the seventy uh, fifth uh, anniversary of the D Day, D -Day. landing, right, I, yeah. I believe. And so I was wondering if uh, this whole incident and also the type of slogan that we've now seen with Donald Trump, "Make America Great mm. Again," and similar slogans in elsewhere, UK, elsewhere yeah. also would, you know, uh, uh, be be uh, well analyzed by that that concept, uh, postcolonial yes. melancholy. Well, I'd like to think so. I mean, I think one of the, one of the I don't know, you never know when your work's going to be intelligible to people. And, and perhaps the, inter the time since I, either things are more stuck than I thought, or, or else I was able, for some peculiar contingencies, a able to anticipate certain patterns that had been bothering me. And I think there are elements of both in that. Uh, that looking at the history of the racial ordering of the country, looking at the history of nationalist thinking and nationalist sentiment, are are good, um, are good, good, are useful, are useful means to um, to map out some of the more pathological features in that culture, and of course they point the the durability and popularity of those responses points to certain, um, y you know, s sort of anachronistic, let's say, features of of the state and of the government, the habits of government in our country. Uh, obviously, you've lived there, so you, you, you know that the British state, not the English one, the British state was designed as a sort of engine for robbing the world. It doesn't have the you know, institutional attributes of, uh, an, of an ordinary modern democracy, and this is why you know, the attachment to the European social model is so, uh, is so intermittent and tenuous. Um, it's 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 a different kind of state. It was produced historically to accomplish different tasks. Um, unfortunately, I would love just to be an ordinary ordinary uh, yeah. democratic state. I, trust me, it would be lovely. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. That's a very good answer. Okay, I looking at the clock, and I think that we should move to a short open Q and A. I know there is someone here who has a microphone. Um, so if you could please raise your hand and don't ask your question until you get your microphone. So there is a question right here. Yes. Um, thank you for this very inspiring discussion. Uh, this question, I think, goes to both of you. Um, I think in many ways we live in a time of crisis. So you mentioned the climate crisis, but also when we see how migrants are received in Europe and in Australia and beyond. It's, it could be described as a time of crisis. Uh, what I find challenging as a scientist uh, myself is how to get through to politicians and to the public uh, with human rights issues, with ethical issues, uh, and being taken seriously as a scientist uh, and not being dismissed as a left-wing activist. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Is, is this a dilemma or something that you also experience, or do you have a solution to how, how can we stay true to our values, be open about our values, and still come across as uh, scientists that have to be taken seriously with our message? 
Uh, should I start? Right. So, I mean, this is not something that I really claim, claim to have any expertise on, but my sense, though, is that uh, it is time to start thinking a little bit differently about uh, sort of how scientists com communicate with uh, uh, policy makers, basically, which is, I think, your, your concern. Um, so that, I mean, I would uh, hope and uh, predict that sort of the role of scientific societies, like uh, the astronomical society of such and such a country and, and, and maybe international societies of these kinds, which are being, I think, established uh, more and more, um, would in increase in this regard. So that you'd, you'd have politicians speaking to uh, people elected by these societies such that they have sort of more clout uh, or more sort of authority uh, in terms of like speaking for their field. So and then it's harder to dismiss someone as a leftist activist when, when it turns out that your point of view is actually the majority or even like something close to the consensus. So I mean, that is just my, my sense and also to, you have, I have some knowledge of this actually happening uh, for people involved with, with climate science. Uh, uh, but and my hope is that this will <laughs> change things for the better in this regard. But I think, yeah, it's a really serious concern. I think that the nature of that dismissal and the nature of the political conflict in which that dismissal appears has been transformed by social and timeline media to a point that is, I mean, this was alluded to earlier on in our discussion, and I don't, I don't I'm not sure I know how to um, navigate that water, really. Um, I think there are, there must be things that one can do to think about uh, uh, managing these questions. I, I think the dismissal of the work as improperly, insufficiently academic, uh, political correctness, uh, Etc. These are things that we have to accept and and to you know be resilient in the face of those dismissals. Uh, I think that uh, one thing I've learned from my own experience of, of writing certain kinds of things is that you you can't really anticipate when your work might be heard by politicians or policymakers or people in different layers of government, not just national government, but local government, or even movements or other institutional initiatives. You, I mean, maybe there are other people who can anticipate those things and judge them carefully, but I, but I'm, I, I don't think that's a very e easy thing. And um, Stuart Hall, who's someone who was my, one of my, my teachers, I learned a lot from and I'm very grateful to um, for defining in many ways what the role of that public intellectual might look like was someone who always said that the politics was in the repetition. The politics is in the repetition. So, so I would say, keep on saying those <laughs> things, you know, and hope for the best. Hope that one day you can be, be heard and don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated by the university managers. Don't be intimidated by the newspapers. Don't be intimidated by the people shouting at you on social media. You know, just try, um, try to do, or get off social media. Actually, that's, <laughs> a, that's a good thing to do: is to retreat from that world and uh, and see if you can find peace and creativity away from the tempo, the insomniac tempo of those technologies. Oh yeah, excellent. Hi. Um, so I kind of have a a question for each of you. And the first question was about, maybe it's more of a comment than a question, but the idea of uh, consensus versus, you know, having that minority asking a different, you know, uh, speaking against the consensus. But I guess the question that that leaves me sitting with is, you know, aren't you just stuck on that question, the question that is being, the, the truth that is being questioned by the minority maybe stops other more interesting and different questions from being put on the table. So I mean, I think, for example, people studying racism have a lot of interesting different things they're studying and uh, are interested, directions they're interested in going in, uh, instead of having to always turn around and answer to the racial essentialists. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. the idea that there, mm -hmm. it is good to have this minority questioning, yeah. I think there is another question under there, which is, doesn't that suggest that the question that is on the table is the right question to be discussing? Whereas there could be other more interesting questions that people are trying to open up, but that are kind of getting stuck in that dynamic. So, uh, and that also leads to the question of like, are those questioners really, are they disingenuous, are they, and, and so on. It, with clim climate science, it's the same mm -hmm. kind of problematic. Mm 
So that's kind of one thought or question I had. And the other is, um, Paul, I was curious what your thoughts or feelings are on the concept of progress. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I suppose, um, how can I put it? I, I believe in evolution, but I, I think the challenge is really to understand evolution as a non-progressive process. So there are, there, are, there are ways of thinking, questions of development, um, questions of that kind which are not linear in character, which uh, again f can function on a number of different scales. Uh, I think, you know, I, I've le learned a critique of the ideology of progress in the in the reading that I did as an undergraduate student, really, with another of my great teachers, Gillian Rose. And w while Gillian was making me read Walter Benjamin, I was reading Du Bois, and I began to see that in both of them was a kind of contrapuntally recoverable account of, well, w in what in both cases looks like something like the dia dialectics of progress and catastrophe. Um, and I would say that some people's progress uh, looks like uh, uh, progress, and to others, it's catastrophe. So without being a, a dialectician, I think one can work within that frame. And in a way, it goes back to, that question goes back to the element of the first question, which I didn't answer, um, and that really relates to the issue of crisis and, and, and how one begins, unfortunately, to at least us, perhaps not yet here, I don't know, to, to, to begin to appreciate that the crisis that we uh, experience is really a chronic phenomenon and is not, and this is the Gramscian argument, it's not, uh, it's not an exceptional condition which will be resolved but is in, in some ways close to the normal functioning of the system uh, that, that we inhabit. And, and that, that too has, I think, implications for the idea of progress. Yeah, so uh, let me kind of address your, your first question. I think that was uh, from Mr. Just me. So um, I, here I think it's useful to make a distinction between sort of what's, what you pursue as a researcher or an expert or a scientist, um, and then what you accept. And I think uh, uh, in that case, you should, you should accept your, uh, your theories and then move on to pursue other things. And, and I think the right response to the sort of the vocal minority who tries to uh, keep going back and, and talk about the same issue one, again and again is just to ignore them, uh, probably, and pursue other questions. Uh, um, and so, I mean, it, it gets a little bit messy. I mean, you need to keep these things in mind. I mean, but, but in, in practice, I think all researchers do this. I mean, they, they, uh, they, they kind of say, well, now that's enough of that, and now we move on. Um, and I think, uh, I think researchers are, are fairly good at that, and they should just continue uh, as, as they were, so, so to speak. And, uh, uh, but I, I do think there's, a, there's an issue of how you deal with the sort of the vocal minorities, uh, just kind of politically. How do you negotiate the fact that there's these people who, who try to get you to, to go back to that kind of question and pr actually prevent progress uh, from happening in your field by virtue of just kind of get, getting you back to the same starting point again and again and again. And, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how to navigate that sort of uh, practically, but I think we... Uh, yeah, in some ways, I think maybe just ignore them, and in some ways, kind of deal with them in other manners. Yeah, which is okay. In, <laughs> which is which is okay until they start shooting at you, or um, right. standing outside your office, or um, yeah. you know, filling your email up with ten million emails and so on. You know, and unfortunately, that's the that's the the world that we are inhabiting right now. Yeah. So, yeah. It's true. So, yeah. so I sympathise, but I, I don't. I don't recognise that as a sufficiently durable um, response. And I think you know, it's a little bit like my dear friend Anthony Appiah's. You know, these bad people should be locked up, kind of thing. <coughs> I mean, yes, the law intervenes at a certain point, um, but uh, but that that's 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 necessary. But it's not a sufficient answer, I would say, um, to use another philosophical mm -hmm. old chestnut. A final, very brief question. Uh, this is a question for <coughs> Paul Gilroy. I, I wondered if you could say something about this phrase, um, the infrahuman presence. I, I don't know if it's a phrase that you have coined, but it, it's in your interview here. <laughs> and um, it, could you say something about that? Well, 
Um, let me think now. How one wins recognition as a human being turns out in many instances to be a much more complicated problem than it might at first uh, appear to be. And the history of struggling to win rights and recognition uh, among racialized people, among colonized people, among enslaved people has often found them consigned elsewhere to different categories which are not entirely animal in character. For example, I mentioned Du Bois earlier on. Du Bois is somebody who uses a different coinage to identify this position. Um, he speaks of the tertium quid, the third thing between the animal and the human, or he speaks of the, ha the half human. Um, and of course, there are other, in other philosophical idioms, in other um, legal uh, devices, there are similar figures, the outlaw, the sacred man, the, um, um, I can't remember the Latin phrase, I'm too tired because I've talked too much today. <laughs> um, and I wanted, uh, in, in a way, I wanted to try to identify those positions which are proximate to the human, but insufficiently human, and, and to try to map the appearance, the epiphanies of these figures in relation to that zone of recognition which is automatically and instantly recognizable as human. And to see that problem as something that evolves through, um, well, I suppose, you know, pre-scientific accounts of racial hierarchy and into the emergence of racial science in the beginning of the 19th century, works through the Darwinian, um, the impact of, uh, of, of, of uh, the Darwinian revolution, and then in the period of uh, the peak period of European colonial domination of the world achieves again a number of other iterations. So I'm I'm interested in that in that uh, in that in the presence of those figures, uh, um, often racialized, although not only racialized. I mean, you know, actually, I I one of the people I admire greatly is is Giorgio Agamben. I know that lots of people don't think much of him, but I really do, and I've always been very stimulated by his work and his insights, and it seems to me that um, there's something of the argument about uh, which, f which beings can be killed with impunity that has a uh, connection to this argument about the infrahuman presence, the infrahuman figure. And, uh, and of course, there's, I mean, this afternoon in my lecture, I talked a little bit about um, some of the wisdom that comes to us from the lagers, you know, from the death factories and the pr concentration camps, something else that's in Agamben's mind. And, and there too you find uh, um, a rich literature which uh, traces the epiphany of these uh, less than human figures, these uh, human in some attributes but not in others, insufficiently human. Uh, this, is, this is part, I think, of how, we, of how we recover a critical vocabulary around the concept of, of racism because the concept of racism itself has been abused so much and, um, and, and invoked so cheaply and lightly that it loses something of its explanatory force. So part of what is important to me is to try to contribute anyway to, to a constellation of alternative concepts that can recover the significance and importance of that enterprise critically. And, and this, this notion of infrahumanity has served me quite well in, 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 in doing that. So that's really what was in my mind. We have reached the end. I hope you will all join me and thank both our speakers, Paul Gilroy and Fino del Sen, the 2019 uh, laureates. Thank you. <laughs>